The process of creation in which both hemispheres partake is where Blake particularly senses the divine working in him. In my brain, he wrote, are studies and chambers filled with books and pictures of old, which I wrote and painted in ages of eternity before my mortal life, and those works are the delight and study of archangels. This suggests a process of creative anamnesia in which the potential paintings and poems are called forth from the unconscious mind. From the research of David McNeil in Chicago, we know that the origins of all thought are global and synthetic before they are subjected to the serial and analytic processing of the left hemisphere for expression in speech. Blake's deep question, tell me where dwell the thoughts forgotten till thou callest them forth, could in one sense then be answered in the unconscious regions of the right hemisphere of the brain. The most compelling image of unconscious inspiration surely comes in Blake's visionary poem, Milton, where, with characteristic specificity and a wonderful refusal to be nonplussed, he believed the soul of Milton had entered his body through the instep of his left foot. Then first I saw him in the zenith as a falling star, descending perpendicular, swift as the swallow or swift, and on my left foot, falling on the tarsus, entered there, thereby gaining literally direct access to the ancient limbic system of the right hemisphere, since the tarsus of the left foot is represented close by, deep in the interhemispheric fissure on the right side. The unconscious is implicit, and all that is implicit and needs to remain that way is best served by the right hemisphere. Poetry and music are the most obvious examples of powerful creations that, as we say, speak to us, but there is no way of making what they speak explicit. Explaining a poem like explaining a joke causes it to fall flat. What is grand, said Blake, is necessarily obscure to weak men. That which can be made explicit to the idiot is not worth my care. The wisest of the ancients considered what is not too explicit as the fittest for instruction because it rouses the faculties to act. In other words, it leaves something for the imagination to come and meet and work with. It's not finished to our hands. Yet over time, things that were implicit and understood spiritually have become explicit and been understood literally, he suggests. The ancient poets animated all sensible objects with gods or geniuses, calling them by the names and adorning them with the properties of woods, rivers, mountains, lakes, cities, nations, and whatever their enlarged and numerous senses could perceive. And particularly they studied the genius of each city and country, placing it under its mental deity, till a system was formed <clears throat> which some took advantage of and enslaved the vulgar by attempting to realize or abstract the mental deities from their objects. Thus began the priesthood, choosing forms of worship from poetic tales. And at length they pronounced that the gods had ordered such things. Thus men forgot that all deities reside in the human breast. In other words, the right hemisphere of the brain. But I must not attempt to systematize Blake myself. For one thing, the attempt would be frustrated by the fact that he seems to say so many contrary things. Blake is full of contraries both in his poetry and in his life. Indeed, Blake it was who said that without contraries, there is no progression. The titles of some of his greatest works suggest this, Songs of Innocence and Experience, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. But these are not mutually exclusive alternatives, as the word marriage here suggests. They are dualities that share a nature, complement one another, and co-arise. You cannot understand Blake without understanding what is known as the coincidentia oppositorum, the coincidence of opposites. This idea, though impossible according to formal logic, is at the heart of all Oriental wisdom literature, whether in the Buddhist, Taoist, Zen, Tantric or Sufi traditions, and in the West, in the work of mystics, such as Meister Eckhart and Jacob Burma, as well as in the philosophy of Heraclitus and, of course, Hegel, and in the conjunctio oppositorum of Jung's depth psychology. This 
is understandable by the right hemisphere, but not the left. Blake's point is not to contrast, but bring together what we normally think of as opposites. Thus, the soul and body are not engaged in a war with one another, as so often in the Christian tradition, but are one. There is a negation, he wrote, and there is a contrary. The negation must be destroyed to redeem the contraries. According to his friend Henry Crabb Robinson, Blake believed that there is suffering in heaven, for where there is the capacity of enjoyment, there is the capacity of pain. Nothing can exist without its opposite, in relation to which it alone has meaning. This is what he meant by his remark that opposition is true friendship, a saying that Blake illustrated perhaps more literally than one would have wished in his life. It's also illustrated in his poetic style. He is at the same time the author of some of the tautest and the most diffuse poetry in the English language. I have to admit to a preference for his amazingly concentrated lyrics, which exemplify everywhere Goethe's saying, in der Beschränkung zeigt sich erst der Meister. It's in constraint that the master is most readily recognized. I think particularly of one of his unmatched masterpieces. You know it well. It begins, I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered threms us flow, and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. This poem went through a number of revisions. The first version had dirty for chartered, thus making a rather direct observation of a primarily visual nature. But whatever is chartered is subject to private control, no longer free. Infinite London and the infinite Thames have both become, in some sense, limited. And then, a stroke of genius. Originally, he wrote, and see in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. But by changing this to mark in every face I meet, he enormously increases the sense of internal cohesion and force. A mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. And the same sound is repeated in chartered streets and chartered Thames, like a succession of hammer blows, the sound of mind-forged manacles being fettled in the furnace of the brain. The tautness is almost hypnotic, an example of the freeing force of the constraint involved in metre and rhyme. Another respect in which Blake brings opposites together is the tension between the general and the particular. Thus in Jerusalem he wrote, he who would do good to another must do it in minute particulars. General good is the plea of the scoundrel, hypocrite and flatterer for art and science cannot exist but in minutely organized particulars and not in generalizing demonstrations of the rational power. Elsewhere in a marginal note in his copy of Reynolds' Discourses, he scribbled, to generalize is to be an idiot, to particularize is the alone distinction of merit. The trouble with this, of course, is that it is a generalization, as are a large number of his pronouncements in the prophetic vein. But the sentiment is clear. This actually reminds me rather of a moment in the life of Brian. I expect most people here have seen that. But there's a rather splendid moment when the, the Christ figure, Brian, is taken retreat in his mother's house, and he's called to the window by the party of his followers who are calling out to speak to him. And he comes to the balcony and he says, listen, you don't need to follow me. You don't need to follow anyone. You're all different. And they all reply, yes, we are all different. And he says, no, no, you misunderstand. You're all individuals. And the voices go, yes, we are all individuals. And then one little bloke goes, wait a minute, I'm not. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> But the sentiment is clear. What actually exists and what the right hemisphere recognizes is the quiddity, the hikiatas, the particularity of individual cases, which are all that actually exist. Generalizations are abstract principles generated by the left hemisphere and do not correspond to real cases. 
a fact only too clearly ignored in the modern West. For example, an organization called NICE, based not far from here, tries to tell psychiatrists like myself how to treat the ideal depressed patient, someone whom I've never actually encountered in real life. In this sense, algorithms with their air of precision are the ultimately imprecise way to proceed since individuals require individual responses if they're to fit at all. We need to go to people like Blake and Goethe to be able to understand that opposites don't have to eliminate one another. In particular, I like very much Goethe's idea, shadowed less explicitly in the words of some of Blake's poems, that we find the infinite not by turning our backs on the finite, but through the finite. We find the general not by turning our backs on the particular, but through the particular, and that there are false dichotomies there. In fact, in the Hasidic tradition, the nature of sephirot, which is essentially the created world, is the synthesis of everything with its opposite. For it is said if they didn't possess the power of synthesis, there would be no energy in anything. This is rather like the idea in Heraclitus of harmonia, two poles that are held in tension and out of which the richness of existence arises. They do not understand, wrote Heraclitus, how a thing agrees at variance with itself. It is a harmonia, like that of the bow or the lyre. To the left hemisphere, two opposing forces just cancel one another out, but that would just produce a string that went slack. However, their opposition produces the power in the bow or the lyre, whereby something proceeds from it at right angles, as it were, to the direction of the tension the hunter's arrow, or the melody of the lyre. Once again, it is the right hemisphere that understands particularity, and it is that which Blake sees as the goal of creation, its rich multiplicity. I think this is what is meant by his wonderful remark, eternity is in love with the productions of time. <coughs> eternity has diversified itself into the creation, like Shelley's dome of many-colored glass that stains the white radiance of eternity or the one that, according to Chinese philosophy, manifests itself in the 10,000 things. And in this creation, there is every bit as much room for the dangerous and awe-inspiring as the tame and comfortable. One law for the lion and lamb is tyranny. And again, the eagle never lost so much time as when he submitted to be taught by the crow. In the book of Thel, he celebrates this diversity in beautiful verses. Does the eagle know what is in the pit, or will thou go ask the mole? Can wisdom be put in a silver ro road, or love in a golden bowl? With what sense is it that the chicken shuns the ravenous hawk? With what sense does the tame pigeon measure out the expanse? With what sense does the bee form cells? Have not the mouse and frog eyes and ears and sense of touch? Yet are their habitations and their pursuits as different as their forms and their joys. Ask the wild ass why he refuses burdens, and the meek camel why he loves man. Is it because of eye, ear, mouth, or skin, or breathing nostrils? No, for these the wolf and tiger have. Ask the blind worm the secrets of the grave, and why her spires love to curl round the bones of death. And ask the ravenous snake where she gets poison, and the winged eagle why he loves the sun. And then tell me the thoughts of man that have been hid of old. I said at the beginning of the talk that asymmetry and symmetry would be important themes, and I was thinking principally of the brain. Yet there can be no more famous use of the word symmetry than Blake's. Fearful symmetry is also the name of a book of criticism, a book about mathematics, a book about physics, three novels, a graphic book, a short story, four TV episodes, a TV documentary, two albums, a musical composition, a rock band, and a particularly difficult ice climb in the Canadian Rockies. Symmetry is a somewhat unusual word for a poem of its period. And it's tempting to think that Blake had some sense of the concept as applying to the workings of the brain. After all, he later specifically refers not just to the tiger's frame or face, but to the brain. In what furnace was thy brain? <laughs> 
Symmetry is an intriguing concept. In the abstract, it's undoubtedly appealing at a very deep level. The word, the word itself means equal measure, and it's a feature of all the ideal typical shapes of regular solids beloved of the Greeks. In mathematics, the term refers not just to symmetry about an axis, but to any procedure which one can perform on an object and leave it unchanged, static. It also signifies independence from contingency. In other words, universality. If a law obeys symmetry, it is universally applicable. Newtonian mechanics obey symmetry. All these meanings align it with the realm of stasis, of universals, of simple ideal forms, the realm of the left hemisphere. Oddly, though, symmetry does not appear in the phenomenal world, although it's approximated by living things, which on closer inspection are, however, like the brain, not truly symmetrical at all and are constantly moving and changing. And though it's often stated that animals find symmetry in a mate attractive, humans appear not, in fact, to share such preferences. Even in cases where symmetry is assessed as more healthy, it's still experienced as less attractive. In fact, symmetry in living faces, because it suggests something mechanical and unreal, borders on the uncanny, a perception that lies behind the fearful nature of the symmetry of Blake's tiger. Symmetry may also have had a special meaning for Blake, since etchers and lithographers, such as Blake, etch back to front and acquire the skill of mirror writing. Whether this may have contributed to Blake's fascination with the relationship between left and right inevitably remains speculative. But when he asks which is the way, the right or the left, and one sees the two hands simultaneously engaged in different activities, namely engraving and writing, there is a reasonable assumption that the idea went deeper. Now, although I would not dare to provide a diagnosis of Blake, there is little doubt that his brain and mind were unusual. He is at the very least eccentric, and though it would be extraordinary for such a high-functioning individual to bear a diagnosis of schizophrenia, it has certainly been mooted. The more obvious signs might be his visions or hallucinations. While he was setting down on paper a vision that he called the ghost of a flea, he reported in a most matter-of-fact way that Edward III had stepped between him and his subject. Clearly, his world was not entirely usual. He had some paranoid features, as we've noted, and I have incidentally noticed in the paintings of schizophrenics that, oddly enough, both cats and fire are surprisingly common themes. On cats, one might compare Blake's contemporary Christopher Smart, who probably did have a form of schizophrenia. One other observation of mine from years of interviewing people with schizophrenia is that they speak of the brain far more often than one might expect. Depressive and anxious subjects tend to speak about their mind, but schizophrenic subjects prefer brain and often talk in sp surprisingly specific terms about a degree of asymmetry. They may speak of their brain having slipped over to one side, being lopsided, not functioning on one side, being shifted over, lighter on one side, and so on, as though they had direct insight into their condition by introspection, <coughs> since schizophrenia is indeed associated with abnormalities of symmetry and asymmetry in both the structure and function of the brain. These thoughts are tentative, and I do not know how much weight to give them, but there is a large body of evidence associating otherwise debilitating mental illness, especially in its milder forms, with creativity, which may explain the remarkably consistent preservation of the genes for major mental illness in populations all over the world. I once asked a patient of mine with schizophrenia <coughs> a standard question from a neuropsychological battery. What is the difference between a river and a canal? He replied without missing a beat, a river is peace, a canal is torment, a line that struck me as worthy of Blake. Whether there's anything in this or not, there's no question that no one's brain was less enclosed into a narrow circle than Blake's. His insights were extraordinary, and one of the most important is his appreciation that the thought of his era was itself becoming more enclosed and narrow. He saw that the paths of genius, whether left or right, were not straightforward, that much was mysterious, unconscious, implicit, unwillable, and that the price of ignoring this was an impoverishment of imagination. As he put it, improvement makes straight roads. 
but the crooked roads without improvement are roads of genius. Carl von Weizsäcker, the 20th century atomic physicist and philosopher, reportedly said, all our thinking about nature must necessarily move in circles or spirals. My experience of reflection over three score years and some is that as individuals or cultures, our thinking does not follow a linear path, but a circular one, as Eliot suggested in the four quartets, arriving where we started and knowing the place for the first time. Or well, not quite. It seems to me we are ascending a spiral, like a staircase from which we can look down on our former vantage point. All the depictions of Jacob's ladder I have ever seen show a straight staircase leading from earth to heaven, except Blake's, which moves very beautifully in a spiral. As we ascend, we see how we thought we had the truth when we didn't, lower on the staircase, and how the staircase winds upward as far as we can see. As Eugene Gendlin put it, we think more than we can say. We feel more than we can think. We live more than we can feel, and there is much else besides. I don't want to end without noting how very funny Blake's poetry can be. Some of it is superb. I wonder whether the girls are mad, and I wonder whether they mean to kill, and I wonder if William Bond will die, for assuredly he is very ill. And some, like his lines on Dr. Johnson, grotesque, irreverent, and delicious. Lo, the bat with leathern wing, winking and blinking, winking and blinking, winking and blinking, like Dr. Johnson. Such was the inimitable genius of one of the greatest poets of the English language, whose greatest poems, The Songs of Innocence and of Experience, published in 1794, had sold less than 30 copies by the time of his death, 33 years later, in 1827. In tribute, I'd like to end by reading his words about the melancholy of finite existence and its eternal aspirations. Ah, sunflower, weary of time, who countest the steps of the sun, seeking after that sweet golden climb where the traveler's journey is done, where the youth pined away with desire and the pale virgin shrouded in snow arise from their graves and aspire where my sunflower wishes to go. Thank you very much. I should apologise that I'm developing some sort of um, infirmity, which means that my voice is giving out a bit. <coughs> I apologise for that. And also, um, the, you know, don't expect me to know a lot about whatever it is you've asked. <laughs> OK, we're now ready for questions. Um, I, I wonder if you're familiar with the work of Stan Groff. I, 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 I know this is more on the psychiatric side than it is on, on the Blake, but it, I mean, Stan writes about the holonomic and the holotropic, um, and uh, it seems to fit well with your left and right brain, except that Stan talks about it in his great book on psychiatry, Beyond the Brain, and I, I wonder if you... Yes, thank you for mentioning that, and uh, uh, yeah, clearly uh, it's not something I know a lot about, but I do know of him and of his theories, and uh, I, I'm, I think that they do, they are largely consistent with what I have to say. Thank you. 
thank you so much for your talk. Um, you were saying about the, the symmetries in animals attracting. I was just wondering sort of what, what that meant in terms of, is that, is that sort of behaviors or, or appearance or, yeah. No, it's um, just that um, uh, it's always said, and I think there's a lot of truth in it, that for example, birds um, prefer mates that have symmetrical plumage. Um, and it's thought that symmetry uh, codes for being in good health, uh, because if there's some inequality, it means there's something gone wrong. Um, may or may not be true. I think there's quite a lot of evidence that it is. But what is fascinating to me is that that doesn't apply to human beings, that um, we may, in fact, judge um, a symmetrical face as healthier, but we don't find it more attractive. And one of the sort of tricks or tropes of modern evolutionary psychology and most reductive science, I'm not saying there's nothing in evolutionary psychology, it can teach us very much, I accept that, but uh, there's a slightly woebegone sort of attempt to make everything uh, reduced to sexual selection. You know, beauty is a, uh, a supposedly uh, something we recognize because we need to make healthy mating choices. Um, well, you know, some and some. Um, <clears throat> when I listen to Bach's 48 or admire Euler's uh, equation e to the i pi equals minus one for its beauty or sit in Santo Spirito Church in Florence admiring the beauty of the architecture or sit on top of uh, the mountain behind my house looking at the, the panoply of the islands, um, sexual selection isn't always on my mind. <laughs> Um, a kind of couple of observations was just to do, I'm reading your book at the moment, but about a couple of other things I've read recently which may or may not be related and you may want to comment on, is one you talked about the um, rise of, you know, the modern capitalist world and the, the, that sort of reasoning. What about historically how that actually happened? So, for example, I'm thinking about um, Giordano Bruno, who's the anniversary of whose um, death was a few weeks ago. He visited, when he visited England, um, he came to Oxford, and the big debate they had then was about, if you've read um, Francis Re Yates, about the nature of memory systems and how you understand the world. And Bruno's position was that you could only understand it through the use of sensory images that meant something to the imagination, and he built a whole uh, system out of that. Um, and, uh, but it was the Oxford academics who rejected that, specifically on the grounds that we don't want to have to do with the senses and materiality, because that's the corrupt world of, you know, a corrupt creation. We want to stick with pure ideas, and that was the debate they had. Um, Second thing is, I read a book a few weeks ago, the title of which is SSOTBM, which is an acronym for the Sex Secrets of the Black Magicians. And um, the thesis of the book is that we have this whole part of our brain which is highly adapted to dealing with social relations, and that's the most advanced part of our brain. And that's why you should use that bit of your brain to think about everything. And that's why you should believe in fairies and personalize everything and, and think of everything as having spirits. It unle and, and basically the argument is that that is what magic is. It's, that it's a series of techniques to mobilize that part of your brain. And the final thing is, being only halfway through your book, um, I don't know whether you ever get to mention that in the four Zoas, Vala, and I think in Jerusalem, the son of Albion, whose spectre is the reasoning power in man, is hand, which I thought you might want to comment on. Well, thank you very much. Um, um, there were many things I didn't mention in my book, and, um, and uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, what I think was quite interesting is, is that Giordano Bruno's idea of how you memorize things has something in common with the descriptions given by so-called savants who associate, uh, this is how the, apparently, as best they can describe, how they're able to memorize things, is they, they do it through associating them with um, colorful shapes and so forth. So things that are perceptible. Um, it still leaves the question quite how you know how you organize those perceptible shapes. So to me, it's still a mystery. Thank you, yeah. In the front row there, there was, yeah. I uh, just wanted to ask about digital and analog, um, yeah. because it seems left brain extending itself in the world through the dominance of digital, is that the case? I'm thinking about analog and vinyl and how it has more quality, um, but has been superseded by the digital, which is cheaper and easier to produce. 
Well, I've heard it said that, you know, the sound from vinyl is sort of better and warmer or something. And, um, you know, just to be perverse, because I'm terribly willing to believe that um, progress is often, uh, you know, one step forward and two back. Um, I'm afraid I rather like um, digital recordings. and <laughs> think, think they're rather clearer and, you know, less corrupt. Um, but... I, yeah, I don't think one can make too much out of the digital and analogue thing because our senses aren't really designed to, to perceive those differences. Do you think about digital in terms of the binary, the on-off binary? Well, yes. But, of course, by an infinite number of on-off decisions, you can represent the most complex things in the world. So, um, in fact, our brains are, some, in some senses, making on-off decisions. So there's nothing wrong with them in themselves. It's when they become the plane of focus of the way we think rather than something that can be used to a better end. Uh, I'm not being very articulate here, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not too fussed about that difference. But what is actually fascinating, if I might just digress a little bit, is that um, the left hemisphere does literally break things down into slices so that people... Uh, almost invariably with right posterior hemisphere lesions, start to see the world as um, like a juddering cine film with slides like this, and they see silhouettes of things uh, moving out in a line. Um, and there's an amazing instance of a man, an acquired savant, who after a head injury, um, a man called Jason Padgett in... Uh, he was a sort of you know, down-to-earth furniture salesman from Tacoma, and uh, he had a henry, and after it, he started to see uh, extraordinary patterns, which he drew. But effectively, what it was, was that all the curves were replaced by tangents and seconds, and everything was divided up into bits... Uh, into frames. And because he's a lot younger than me, he didn't say like a juddering cine film. He said as though someone's turning the remote on the film on and off. But uh, that idea is fascinating. And, uh, and you know, uh, we, we know from other cases that when people have a right hemisphere stroke, in some instances, they actually see time and motion stop. So one man in the shower had a right hemisphere stroke. And he said, I could see suddenly each drop of water suspended in space and very clear, unlike the flow that one normally sees. And then out of the periphery of his vision, where the left hemisphere wasn't so focused, he could see things running away. Um, so I, I think this business about motion and flow is very deep. I uh, sort of alluded to it rather briefly in the talk, but in fact I'm writing at much greater length about it because I think the two hemispheres give rise to different senses of space, time and motion. And, and they've, they've, they've become very... Um, interesting topics to me because I think a lot of the arguments in philosophy and even in physics boil down to discrepancies which may be to do with hemisphere differences. I mean, I don't want to make grand claims, but I think they can at least illuminate. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture this evening and for your book, which has had a profound impact on my life. It was transformative. Um, one thing I was left with, though, on finishing it, it's a few years back since I read it, was um, Socrates doesn't come out so well in it. And I wondered if you could say something more about that, because Socrates was considered the wisest because he knew nothing, and yet, as I say, my recollection from reading your book was, hmm, Socrates hasn't come out well here. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right, and um, uh, it, it, it's a vulnerable point. I can sort of um, get out of it by saying, which I think is a bit fair, that I actually distinguish between Socrates and Plato. And uh, I don't think I say anything critical about Socrates, you'll find. But Plato, um, at various times, because after all, they won't all produce the dialogues at once, um, seems to have adopted different positions on what sort of things Socrates was saying. I think it's a bit like the Gospels. We don't really know, because Socrates didn't believe in writing things down. He thought that that corrupted the whole business of philosophy, which should be something, a discussion between friends. So um, I think Plato has a lot to answer for. Um, I'm hardly, you know, the first person to have said that. Um, it's almost a commonplace that something started to go wrong with Western thinking around that time. 
and yet Plato and Aristotle are surely among the greatest philosophical minds that lived, and certainly Plato is um, full of rather powerful myths, uh, as well as uh, simply scoring logical points, so to speak. And, and of course, he didn't assert anything. I mean, he simply was helping to, as we would now say, problematize ways of thinking. So, um, I think I've, I'm trying to make amends for what I did, but by saying I do appreciate that Plato is very complicated and, and has many sides, and some of them we like and some of them we don't. Oh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the talk. I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about hands. About? Which, about hands. And hands. hands as being, in a sense, one of the symmetrical parts of the human body. Yes. And yet, individually, they are, as Kant sort of discussed in an early work, incongruent counterparts. You can't turn a left hand into a right hand except by adding another spatial dimension. But I think... The other question I wanted to ask you, given the differences in handedness, as a psychiatrist, uh, does being ambidextrous or does having extreme handedness link to other sort of aspects of personality? Um, uh, hands alone could form the subject of a week's seminars, but I mean, First of all, I'm not talking about handedness as such, um, because as you probably know, 60% um, of left-handers still have speech in the left hemisphere, like 97% of right-handers. And so there's not, you know, the, the, there are many ways in which the brain can be organised. And the best book on that is definitely by Chris McManus, called Right Hand, Left Hand, which will probably remain the Bible on that topic for the foreseeable future. Um, chirality, which is what you're referring to, that the hands don't map onto one another, you can't put the glove from the right hand onto the left, um, is, uh, as any chemist knows, a very important part of the nature of molecular structure and may uh, represent something about symmetry in the universe. And symmetry is an incredibly interesting topic on its own, which, again, I'm afraid I've only just been able to touch on. Um, about handedness and extreme handedness and mixed handedness, what seems to come out of the literature is that um, uh, a lot of the more unusual arrangements, if I might put it, anomalous dominances in the brain are associated with um, mixed handedness and that um, extreme light left handedness and extreme right handedness have more in common with one another than either do with um, middle and sort of weak handedness. Uh, but it's a hugely, I mean, this, for all I, I may know, you may be the world's expert on this, but it is an extremely complicated topic and not one I have time to cover here or really could cover here. Um, it is fascinating though because when I first started thinking about topics of research to do with laterality many years ago, I noticed that left-handedness and mixed-handedness were more common in schizophrenia, more common in manic depressive psychosis, more common in autism, more common in extreme talent. So many, uh, many of the great artists, poets and so on, are more anomalously handed. So, uh, and actually what happens is that anomalous handedness is overrepresented at the top and the bottom of the scale. Once again, an instance where the extremes are, uh, come together, if you like, and uh, make a contrast with the middle territory. Um, reading your book, I get the, I get the idea that you, you're pretty despairing about our present time. And um, I'm wondering if the, any of that's got to do with the fact of people's obsessions for machines and gadgets, particularly the, you know, computers, mobile phones, which seem to be so omnipresent. Well, I might surprise you. Um, I always call myself a hopeful pessimist. Uh, perhaps it's a bit Blakeian. Um, but what I mean by that is... Um, 
that while I think things are going very badly wrong, I know that it is a fool who predicts how things will go, and I, there is room for hope. And one very particular reason for hope is that everywhere I talk, people of all ages um, seem to warm to what I say. I mean, tonight I was mainly talking about Blake, but very often I do talk about problems uh, of the overdrive of the left hemisphere in modern culture, as I see it. And, you know, people are dying to hear um, that, you know, a new angle on this and are very concerned about it. Nonetheless, we keep on going in the, in the same direction. Uh, and it's almost as though the sort of machinery is more powerful than the people in it. I sometimes think that, you know, when I meet people from bureau... I had, a, I had a letter from a health and safety man who really liked my book, and I was thinking, my God, that's interesting, because the health and safety mentality is exactly the sort of pedantic application of life-killing rules that I'm somewhat opposed to. But I think people get into organisations, but they can't help the culture of the organisation, and they don't like it either, but that's their job. So I'm not a, entirely... A pe uh, um, uh, hopeless, but I am pessimistic about the way things are going now. And in brief, um, yes, I mean, machines are not infernal in themselves, but they can often be used in a way which uh, is very dehumanising. And I do worry about reports I get from teachers that, for example, um, now they have to teach children how to read the human face, um, something which 10 years ago would have been only the case in somebody who was clearly autistic. Um, and there's nothing more uh, human than the, the business of reading and interpreting and understanding one another's faces. I mean, it's fundamental to being human. So it, that, there are reasons to be very worried and not complacent, but there are reasons to be hopeful because humanity is more resourceful and unpredictable than we can know. Thanks for a very interesting talk. I have an, a little bit of an issue with this uh, dichotomization of the left and the right hemisphere. I think it's a bit overstated. I mean, my experience of neuroimaging, which I've done for 20 years now, is, is almost every function we've measured is more or less bilateral. And novelty processing is, uh, for example, quite bilateral, or self-referential thinking is not in the left hemisphere. It's actually in the middle, it's a default mode network. So I wonder whether you could comment, because you yourself started at the beginning, and then you went back, you, you said at the beginning, you know, that this idea of left-right is, is not quite correct and most, is, most functions are bilateral. But then you went on and, and, and it's over, in my view, overstating a little bit the differences. I, I, I think I can tell you haven't read my book, is that right? No, no. Um, <laughs> I think you'd find my, the, the answers to your questions in reading it, but um, let me say that what I've had to do is summarise an incredibly complex uh, thesis in very simple phrases. Um, and I almost have to assume that my audience have already read the book to be able to use what I've said, because otherwise it will sound, as you say, rather basic. Um, if you still think after reading it that it is basic and that I've got it wrong, please correspond with me. But I know perfectly well that it's very, very complicated about where the self is and so on, and it's not just in one hemisphere or another, and referring to the self is not just in one hemisphere either. But I'm talking at a more philosophical level about the, the nature of the phenomenological world subtended by each hemisphere, in one of which things are more self-referential, actually, than they are in the other. It's not, it's not detectable simply through... Um, uh, the, the two levels of argument, and sometimes it gets bogged down a bit. It, it, may I put it like this? I mean, often people say, um, well, you know, the two hemispheres, they're far more like one another than they are different. Well, you know, fair enough, but... Um, but George W. Bush and Einstein are far more like one another than they are different, but sometimes it's the differences that actually make the difference. And, the, you know, the other thing is, um, it's a bit like if um, you ask me, what's the difference between CNN News and Fox News? And, um, uh, and I, you know, tried to answer that in human terms. And, and you said, but, you know, they're, they're both practically identical. They both use cameras and they send messages to plasma screens and cathode ray tubes. The apparatus looks pretty much identical. But actually, at the phenomenological level, completely different. So, 
I work in the book from the data about differences up in layers, which makes sense philosophically speaking. So please don't assume that I make naive and crude differences because my whole, you know, the whole of the work of the last 30 years and which is poured out in that book is about not making those differences. Thank you. Um, a question about countries and yes, Blake. Yes, um, Blake uh, continually plays with magnificent contraries, um, differences, different ways of saying and looking at the world. Um, it seems to me, if you apply that to symmetry and asymmetry, what's really interesting is the interplay, the relationship between symmetry and asymmetry. Absolutely. Um, it's, we're all, um, broad, broadly speaking, symmetrical, but of course we're not at all. We're, we're what? That's, we're broadly speaking symmetrical, but of course yes. we're not symmetrical at all, and it's, yes. that's, the, that's where the fascination is. I just wondered if you would like to comment. I would indeed. I mean, asymmetry and symmetry are very close. In fact, you can't possibly have asymmetry without implied symmetry. Um, for example, the contents of your bag are not asymmetrical, they're just a mess. Um, <laughs> uh, so for something to be asymmetrical, it has to have suggested the possibility of symmetry. And it seems that in the creation of the universe, this principle of the dance between symmetry and asymmetry, the asymmetry between symmetry and asymmetry, is essential. And as far as I understand the physics, there needs to have been an essential asymmetry between matter and antimatter um, at the beginning of the universe. And there also is going back into the, 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 the sort of most ancient background radiation of the universe, a ripple, a disturbance, which if there had been complete symmetry, there would be no generation of disturbance. And disturbance is creativity, because it's flow and change. And in fact, in a universe that was static, there would be, that was symmetrical, it would have to be static. It, it, it couldn't, it could have no creative power. On the other hand, the asymmetry can only work because the opposites have some relationship with one another. So it's difference within, uh, or, uh, difference within union. There is a, not perhaps particularly helpful, but very precise remark by Hegel, which makes, says everything, which is that it is the um, union of disunion with union, out of which everything comes. <laughs> and that, that, uh, that is a very profound saying, I think. Um, and my belief is that there are no such thing as these finished symmetrical shapes. They exist only in our left hemispheres. And that there is, in fact, something that is growing and changing and flowing all the time. And which is in its nature um, necessarily uh, exemplifying this business of symmetry and asymmetry. And it's the dance, as I say, between these things out of which everything seems to come. I mean, that sounds mystical, but it, perhaps it is. Final question. Hello. I just wanted to ask you quickly, uh, you talked about schizophrenia and its relation to Blake in your talk, and I thought it was quite interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask you what, you thought the interplay between perhaps something like plurality, which is tangentially related to schizophrenia, and the relation between that and Blake, and what that might be? Plurality. There's a, a small topic. Um, um, I think that it, it's rather like what I was saying about the one and the many, that the manifoldness and the coming together and the simplification need both to sort of exist together. I, I, I don't quite know how you, why you were associating plurality with schizophrenia. Um, I mean, there, there were all sorts of theories about schizophrenia and its diagnosis has changed over time and it covers a wide range of spectra, but um, I think I've just not actually heard what the crucial point was there. <laughs>
Sorry about that. Perhaps you can tell me afterwards. Hmm. Okay. Our thanks to Ian McGilchrist for his annual lecture for 2016, and thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs>